Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of a comprehensive review of dermatopathology. Today, we're going to cover vesicular bullus and granulomatous dermatitides. So to start with the vesicular bullus section, we're going to begin at the top of the epidermis and move our way downward. Um, so we'll begin in the cornified layer, either with an intracorneal split or a subcorneal split, and that could be a clean split or a pustule. And that includes entities such as infections like dermatophyte or impetigo, autoimmune blistering conditions such as pemphigus foliaceus or IgA pemphigus. You can have toxin mediated splits like staph's scalded skin. Um, a number of the infantile pustular entities such as infantile acropustulosis, erythema toxica neonatorum, and transient neonatal pustulosis would be in this category. Pustular drug eruptions such as AGEP or subcorneal pustular dermatoses, in addition to pustular psoriasis, would be in this category. So here is a slide, and you can see beneath the cornified layer is a pustule. It may be called a spongiform pustule because you have spongiosis, as you can see with the daylight between the keratinocytes and neutrophils are moving upward, and you have a subcorneal pustule that then results in some neutrophils in the cornified layer. And there's a differential diagnosis for this that includes all of those things that we mentioned. It could be infectious, it could be a pustular drug eruption, it could be early pustular psoriasis, um, and different factors such as bug stains, um, clinical presentation, the number of eosinophils might help you distinguish one from the other. It would certainly be helpful to know if you're dealing with a baby or an adult, but this is the pattern that generates, generates that diagnosis. This particular case, I believe, was a, um, a case of AGEP. So here's another case where you can see beneath the cornified layer is a pustule, and you can see clusters of cocci beneath here, and this would be impetigo, a pustule forming. And we'll see later on, impetigo often causes some acanthalysis of the keratinocytes in a particular pattern that I'll point out. Here's another instance where you have, you know, a lot of debris and there were kind of pustules, but you see a split forming within the cornified layer. And when you go in quickly, I'm sorry, when you go in closely, you can see that these neutrophils should make you want to exclude an infection. And when we do a PAS stain, you can appreciate here, there are hyphal forms. This is a dermatophyte infection causing a split in the cornified layer with neutrophils. So what does an autoimmune blistering disorder look like? This is pemphigus foliaceus. As we mentioned in the spongiotic section, when you see neutrophilic spongiosis, you have to consider autoimmune blistering disorders, especially intraepidermal autoimmune blistering disorders. So pemphigus foliaceus tends to split at the very surface of the epidermis in the granular layer. And sometimes it can be difficult to tell if you're looking at a real split or if you're looking at an artifactual split from processing. But one of the clues is that if you see here, your split is happening around individual cells. It's not splitting through the middle of a cell, which would make you suspect that it was due to artifact. So this is happening very intentionally from an antibody mediated response. So this is pemphigus foliaceus, which otherwise looks very much like staph scalded skin or other entities like that. So the next photograph you can see, pemphigus foliaceus also tends to be to retain the shape that the granular layer has of these flattened squamous cells, whereas bullus and vitigo tends to retain the roundness of the cells. The acanthalysis of the keratinocytes is also superficial, and it can be even above the epidermis like we saw in the other case. But often if you do see superficial acanthalysis in your subcorneal split, um, and they retain this round shape, then you would favor impetigo over pemphigus foliaceus. So intraepidermal blisters is kind of, it includes subcorneal blisters, but this just kind of implies you're a little bit lower now in the middle of the epidermis. And these blisters can be caused 
by acute spongiotic dermatitides that are vesicular, blistering viral exanthems, such as we saw with Coxsackie, where you can get the ballooning degeneration, or even a herpes virus infection, where you get that molding margination and multinucleation. You can see intraepidermal blisters from friction or trauma that are caused outside inside. You can have autoimmune blistering disorders, genetic blistering disorders, and inexplicable disorders such as Grover's. So here's a picture of friction. One thing that you will note is that you have a lot of death. You see dead cells lose their nucleus. You see a lot of death that isn't necessarily confined to one specific layer of the epidermis. That makes you suspicious that this is not an autoimmune entity or an inflammatory process, rather an outside inside process. Pemphigus, on the other hand, is an autoimmune process and it begins with acantholysis of the epidermis, possibly some neutrophils, which before it splits looks like spongiosis because you just have increased space between the keratinocytes. And it tends to be a suprabasilar split, meaning that the split is right above the basal layer of keratinocytes and it extends down in nexal, in nexal structures. And this can help you in cases where it's hard to distinguish it from other intraepidermal blistering disorders. Like I mentioned, you can have neutrophilic spongiosis in the beginning. So here's a picture of early pemphigus. So like I said, before it splits, it looks like spongiosis because your cells, before they tear apart, are just have increased space between the desmosomes. And then you have an infiltrate that often can be neutrophils, but not always. Here again, it looks like you're making a vesicle, you, you have a few neutrophils in the epidermis, but this is what it looks like before it's a clear cut split. Now here you have a more obvious split. Here you have this suprabasilar split. Here again, your split is right above the basal layer, suprabasilar. This is an artifact, ignore that. I'm not sure what, why that is there, but you have neutrophils here in the different sections showing that the early autoimmune blistering disorder can bring those cells. Haley Haley, on the other hand, has been described as a dilapidated brick wall. So as opposed to having this tendency to be super basilar split, now you tend to split through more layers of the epidermis all at the same time. And then to distinguish it from other entities with acantholysis that have dyskeratosis, Haley Haley does not have dyskeratosis, meaning no corons or grains and there's a negative DIF. So here is a picture of Haley Haley, and you have acantholysis between multiple layers of the epidermis. You see here, you have a few necrotic keratinocytes just because you know, as cells separate, they may lose viability, but you do not have dismaturation or dyskeratosis manifesting as those funky dying cells we pointed out earlier, which are the dyskeratotic cells. So Haley Haley here is splitting it more like a dilapidated brick wall as opposed to a single suprabasilar level. There's an up close picture of the acantholysis between those cells in this genetic disorder as opposed to an antibody mediated disorder. So in contrast to Haley Haley, we have the acantholytic dyskeratosis pattern, which we see in Grover's disease and Derrier's disease. So here you have acantholysis with corons and grains. And you can also see this in a warty dyskeratoma. So here we see acantholysis. It tends to be suprabasilar also, so often people will mistake in this for pemphigus also. But the key is these funny cells, these funny cells up here resulting in funny parakeratotic grains are your dyskeratosis, and that is a sign that you're dealing with this differential as opposed to the differential of Pemphigus or Haley Haley. Here's an up close picture of a coron. See, as it's maturing, it's maturing and dying improperly, resulting in funny looking cells that produce funny looking parakeratotic grains. Here's a case of patient with Darius, see, you have your nice super basal or split that looks a whole lot like pemphigus, but when you look up close, you have this dismaturation, these dyskeratotic cells that tell you that you are dealing with Darius. This was a patient with a familial disease. 
So clinical history also helps. And this is in contrast with Haley Haley, where you can see this split through more layers of the epidermis and a lack of this dismaturation. Now moving on to subepidermal blisters, I like to separate these into different inflammatory cells. So you either have posse cellular subepidermal blisters, which I think of EBA, epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita, as sort of a hallmark of this. You have porphyria cutanea tarda, TEN, coma blisters, those are all posse cellular, meaning not a lot of inflammatory cells. You can have a subepidermal blister with eosinophils, which tends to be pemphigoid or you know, a drug eruption, or you can have a subepidermal blister with neutrophils, in which case dermatitis repetiformis, linear IgA, bullous lupus, or even cicatricial pemphigoid can be on your differential, though um, that tends to be more posse cellular as well. So this is my rough drawing of your basement membrane zone. In your keratinocyte, just as a reminder, here's your hemidesmosome that holds your keratinocyte to the basement membrane. And this is where your BP230 antigen is and your BP180, and then your laminins. And then here's your lamina densa, which is collagen four, and your collagen seven, which is your anchoring fibrils. So when you do a salt split in a direct immunofluorescent study, you're cutting through collagen four right above here. So collagen four, if you do an immunostain, stains the base. So your BP antigens, which are the targets for bullous pemphigoid, are going to split to the roof of a blister. And collagen seven, which is the target antigen for epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita, or bullous lupus, will split to the floor of the blister, okay? So, bullous pemphigoid, well, what does it look like histopathologically? Early lesions show eosinophilic spongiosis, which we covered in the spongiotic chapter. The eosinophil line up beneath the DEJ in a way that really other entities don't do so much. And you have minimal edema at the site of the split because this is an autoimmune blistering disease. This is not blistering because you have a rush of edema. And it tends to be a superficial infiltrate. So if you have a superficial and deep infiltrate, be suspicious that you're dealing with you know, a vesicular bug or drug eruption rather than bullous pemphigoid. And as a review, the salt split in a DIF, you will see linear IgG and C3 on the roof of the blister. So here's a picture of bullous pemphigoid. And as you can see, you have many eosinophils in your infiltrate. And you can see a very, very clean split from the epidermis to the dermis. Fluid inside the blister doesn't count because anytime your body forms a space, it will fill it with fluid. It is most important to note that here in the papilla of the dermis, there's not a significant amount of edema. So this is a clean split. An autoimmune disease tends to cause a clean split. Here's another example. Eosinophils at your DEJ, causing this clean split subepidermally from your epidermis in your dermis. And here's early bullous pemphigoid, where you have the eosinophils lining up, and you have a few eosinophils in the epidermis, and you have a dense eosinophilic infiltrate in the superficial dermis. And it's never particularly urticarial looking on histopathology. Clinically, it looks urticarial. We call this urticarial stage of BP, but really that correlates with this infiltrate of EOs and this eosinophilic spongiosis. And here's a picture of that split off cleanly. And then you will have an infiltrate of EOs, clean split. All right, moving on to epidermal lysis bullosa acquisita. So we mentioned, I mentioned that that was a posse cellular subepidermal split. Target is collagen four. Um, and then the salt split will be present on the linear staining will be present on the floor of the blister. So here's a picture of the epidermis floating off from the dermis in a patient with EBA. And as you can see from low power, there's very little inflammation. When you go up closer, you can see that the clean split, again, this is an autoimmune blistering disorder. So it's a clean split and we don't have very much inflammation, if at all. Porphyria cutanea tarda, this is a subepidermal split that has this kind of interesting pattern where you tend to 
preserve the shape of your dermal papilla. So we just saw an EDA, it was flat for whatever reason, and porphyria cutanea tarda, tarda it tends to stay papillated. This is also posicellular, and it has this additional finding of this hyaline material, meaning a, a smudgy pink material deposited in the basement membrane zone and around the superficial blood vessels. On DIF, this doesn't look like a clean, crisp line the way it does with our autoimmune blistering disorders. It's kind of just this hazy enhancement in these areas. You can see the same findings for pseudoporphyria. So here's an example of porphyria cutanea tarda. These are your dermal papilla with the little superficial vessels that you're seeing in the split. Here's another area where it's split. When you look up high, you can see these caterpillar bodies. That's that PAS material present in the epidermis. And then if you look around the vessels, which I'll show you up close, you can see that there's this kind of thickened pink material around the vessels, which is easier to appreciate if you look at normal vessels side by side. Like normally vessels, you shouldn't see the outline beyond just a fine line, but here you're seeing this kind of thickening around the vessels. That's a feature of porphyria cutanea tarda. Here's another example. You're preserving your papilla, some caterpillar bodies, thickening of the vessels, posse cellular subepidermal split. So other things that fall in the subepidermal split category that are not autoimmune mediated are SJS TEN. So it's important to note that this begins with an interface. So back to our interface section, we have lymphocytes that cause damage to our DEJ, and in doing so, they necrose the epidermis in a very florid pattern. And there's, it could be fairly sparse inflammation that does it. So all we see is necrosis of the epidermis, and how are we gonna know this is SJSTEN as opposed to you an old blister of an autoimmune blistering disorder, well, when we go up close, you're going to see these lymphocytes causing vacuolar alteration and necrotic keratinocytes at the DEJ. That results in this very acute, right? See our acute horn, hornified layer, acute necrosis of the epidermis. Those are the key features of SJSTEN, which are distinguished obviously on clinical, um, with clinical criteria. A coma blister is basically a blister that are results from lack of perfusion. So it's not an autoimmune thing and it's not an inflammatory process either. So it's posicellular. The key finding would be these necrotic eccrine coils that sort of also point in the direction of ischemia. So one of the keys here in this blister is as you can see, some of it is subepidermal, some of it is intraepidermal and all the way up through the hornified layer. So you're splitting in multiple different layers, which makes you suspicious that either this is something outside in right, like trauma or shear force or, you know, an ischemic event which causes trauma. And then here you can see the ischemia to your eccrine coils. So split through different levels of the epidermis, necrosis here, because it's split, you know, it's no longer getting perfused. So any blister long term will start to die. And here's unhealthy looking eccrine coils. You can see the colors are getting fuzzy, you get little purplish specks in there that's unhealthy looking epithelial cells surrounding your eccrine coils. So moving on to neutrophilic infiltrates that cause subepidermal blisters. This is a, another autoimmune blistering condition, so you're not going to see a whole lot of edema, but you see neutrophils at the tips of the dermal papilla, and you can have eosinophils or not. So here you have clusters of neutrophils. This is not an interface, right, because interface is with lymphocytes. These are neutrophils cluster here, and sometimes that's all you see to tell you that this is dermatitis herpetiformis. And then you're going to see on DIF little clusters of IgA in the dermal papilla. Here's another example of dermatitis herpetiformis. Now you have more obvious neutrophils, and it looks a little bit edematous, but that's because it's splitting and the edema is starting to fill the blister cavity. Linear IgA, on the other hand, tends to be less of a pattern that clusters in papilla and more of a subepidermal split where you just see that there is a neutrophilic component. It's essentially the same histopathologic disease as chronic bullous disease of childhood. And you'll see a smooth linear deposition of IgA at the basement membrane zone on DIF as opposed to the granular collections of it with DH. 
So here's a subepidermal blister with fluid in the blister and a clean split at the dermis, right? And then you can see the blister fluid is filled mostly with neutrophils, so it would make you suspicious of that. But certainly, we would need a direct immunofluorescence study to confirm these diagnoses. And this is in contrast to blistering disorders we could see with a lot of dermal edema, right? So for example, sweets here, you have a dense neutrophilic infiltrate and a lot of edema, and you can see these strands through the fluid and that's getting pulled apart. That's what edema blisters look like versus autoimmune blistering disorders where you have cleanly separated from the dermis and then you just have blister fluid in there. And this is just a summary. Subepidermal blister with eosinophils would be a pattern for bullous pemphigoid. Intraepidermal blister from clean acantholysis here in Haley Haley. Intraepidermal blister from acute spongiosis here is like an allergic contact dermatitis. This is our ballooning degeneration with an interface dermatitis that we see with, say, a Coxsackie virus in hand, foot, and mouth. Okay, so clean split. This is blister beneath the epidermis, right? Intraepidermal and ballooning degeneration causing kind of a dirty vesicle. Moving on to granulomatous inflammation. There's different ways to divide up the categories of granulomatous inflammation. So for the sake of keeping it consistent, I'll pick one method and kind of define what these terms are. Sarcoidal granulomas we're familiar with tend to be the quote unquote naked granulomas. Tuberculoid tend to be less naked. So they're nodular collections of histiocytes, some of which are multinucleated and these tend to have less lymphocytes surrounding the nodule. These tend to have lymphocytes and plasma cells surrounding the nodules, maybe with some caseating necrosis. And then you have your necrobiotic types of granulomas, which I usually just separate into palisaded or interstitial patterns. So either palisade around an area of necrobiosis or the histiocytes are more interstitial throughout the dermis in that pattern or you can have separative and granulomatous dermatitis. So we'll go through those. So sarcoidal, like I said, quote unquote naked. The reason I put it in quotes is because it's almost never that naked and I see a lot of residents um, run into the mistake of excluding sarcoid because they think they see too many lymphocytes. So I want to caution you against taking things too literally. But sarcoid and foreign body granulomas are things that have this pattern. So here's an example of a sarcoidal granuloma that's not particularly naked, but you can see these well-formed collections of the histiocytes, which are the bigger cells with the pink cytoplasm. Some are multinucleated. You'll always have a perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate, right? Because inflammation needs to travel in through the vessels and the lymphocytes you know, signal to the histiocytes to come make this inflammation. But relatively you do not have too many lymphocytes surrounding your nodules of granulomas so that's what they classify as relatively naked so here's an up close picture of those granulomas here is a more exuberant version of a sarcoidal granuloma where you can see it through most of the dermis it's, it's occupied by these very confluent nodular collections of histiocytes, which are all granulomas, okay? And remember, sarcoid is a diagnosis of exclusion, so you have to make sure there's no foreign body, you have to do some bug stains to make sure there's no occult infection before you can say, I think this is sarcoid. So foreign body, we can see tattoo reactions or polarizable foreign material. So in this particular case, you can see down deep, you have nodular collections of histiocytes. It almost looks like a tumor. It's so dense, these sarcoidal granulomas. And you can see now that they're filled with this foreign material, which happens to be calcium hydroxyl apatite, which is radius, right? So this is a radius granuloma. Moving on to tuberculoid granulomas. These are nodular collections with the rim of lymphocytes and plasma cells, and it can become confluent. We'll see these in infectious processes if there's caseation necrosis, so tuberculosis, leprosy, leishmaniasis, Crohn's. You can see mycobacteria, other mycobacterial infections, lupus miliaris, rosacea. So let's go through this category. So here's leprosy. You can see that these 
granulomas. Now, rather than being round, they can sometimes join together and become very long sausage shapes, and that tends to be a hallmark of leprosy. Here is an example where the granuloma, as you can see, has many more lymphocytes in it than those sarcoidal ones did, is wrapping around a nerve. Here within the dermis is this dense infiltrate. And when you look up close, it's actually many, many histiocytes with admixed lymphocytes. And then within the histiocytes, you can see all these little organisms that are parasitized within the histiocytes. And this is leishmaniasis. And then here, these are fairly ill-defined, but there are little collections of histiocytes in the dermis. Anytime you see collections, it's worth mentioning in DermPath that there's a granulomatous component because immediately you think of certain elements on your differential. And so this loose, weak granuloma was actually cutaneous Crohn's. Lupus miliaris disseminatus fasciae, you can either put it in the palisading granuloma category or you could put it in this um, tuberculoid granuloma category with caseation necrosis. But Regardless of what category you want to put it in, it basically looks like a small rheumatoid nodule on the face. So rheumatoid nodules, as we'll talk about soon, look like a caricature of a palisade. So you have this perfect palisade of histiocytes in this very, very, very homogeneously eosinophilic center. Okay, And this looks like a rheumatoid nodule, but it's really tiny. And if you look, you have these little vellus hairs everywhere, suggesting that you're actually near an eyelid. So rheumatoid nodules tend not to occur there. This is what lupus miliaris disseminatus fasciae looks like, which is some, some subcategory of rosacea, we believe. And so certainly granulomus rosacea can have this pattern as well. So the necrobiotic category, this is where we talk about the palisading and the interstitial patterns. And what in the world does necrobiosis mean? To me, necrobiosis means blurry, unhealthy, dying collagen, that is not dead collagen. So dead collagen would be lacking nuclei, completely pink, dead, non-viable tissue. Whereas this one, kind of like what we saw with those eccrine coils where you start getting blurring of the cells and some blue granular material, you just start to see it looking unhealthy, but it's not quite dead. That is what necrobiosis is. And so these entities would fall into this category. So granuloma annulare, it tends to always be palisaded or interstitial or a combination of both. I usually see it as a combination of both, depending on where you cut it. But it surrounds an area of necrobiosis with increased mucin. So if you can vaguely see here, you have histiocytes palisading around this area of mucin, but you can also say, but they're very interstitial. See what I mean? And it's also good to appreciate that granuloma annulare tends to occur in these round shapes in the dermis. So going up close, you can see these more pink cells. These are your histiocytes. And they sort of abstractly palisade around this area where your collagen is a little smudgier than usual. It's not healthy. It's not dead. Somewhere in between. And you have increased mucin. And see, here's a more interstitial pattern with your histiocytes, some of them are multinucleated. See, here's your collagen that's a little bit unhealthy. See that you've got that kind of pinkish color in there, but you've got all this mucin and these are your histiocytes. Here's another picture, low power. You can vaguely make out that there's this round shape here, maybe a round shape here. And then that round shape is mostly interstitial, right? You, ha you have these big nuclei and these pink kind of pale cells that go around this area and you have this hue of blue because there's all this mucin where your collagen is sort of necrobiotic. Here's another picture of necrobiosis. See, this is what I'm talking about. See how that's not very healthy looking collagen? That's necrobiosis and you've got increased mucin through and through. And of course, it's sort of palisades around it, but it's sort of very interstitial, meaning between the collagen bundles. Necrobiosis lipoidica actually have a, has a lot of overlap with granuloma annulare and makes sense because 
necrobiosis lipoida can, can be seen in patients with diabetes and so can disseminated granuloma annularis. So how do we distinguish them? Well, like I mentioned, granuloma annularis tends to occur more in these round shapes and necrobiosis lipoidica tends to occur more in horizontal layering shapes. They might be horizontal or slightly slanted, but they're more linear than round and they can be more widespread than the granuloma annulare. You can often see plasma cells. Of course, they occur on shins where you might see plasma cells anyway, and they can also extend throughout the dermis into the fat. So this case, you can see it's not perfectly linear, but it's not so round like that other case that I was showing you. So this more cellular area is where your histiocytes are quote unquote palisading around this area of collagen, which if you compare to this collagen, doesn't look exactly right. So again, this is your sort of unhealthy, see how it's a little shaggy looking collagen, but not dead. These are your histiocytes. And then around your vessels, you can see your infiltrate is filled with plasma cells and lymphocytes. You always have lymphocytes, okay? Here again, Here's your unhealthy collagen, necrobiosis, a little bit of blue. I think it's like a little bit of calcium that collects as the tissue's dying. Here's your histiocytes. You know, you may or may not have eosinophils. But otherwise, there's a lot of overlap with granuloma annularis. So round versus horizontal, obviously, you can see is like not great and strict criteria. A rheumatoid nodule, on the other hand, if I were to say granuloma annularis is like an abstract painting of a palisade. A rheumatoid nodule is like a caricature of a palisade. This is a very well-developed palisade. You could draw it like a little kid could draw it because it's like a cartoon. So now you've got this perfect palisade of these histiocytes around this very, very, very homogeneous pink zone of necrobiosis or caseation necrosis, whatever you want to call this. All right, so these are your histiocytes. Here's your homogeneous pink material. Here's another area of rheumatoid nodule. Here's your palisade of histiocytes and your homogeneous pink material. So that's what rheumatoid nodules look like and it should remind you of the lupus miliaris case that we saw earlier. Necrobiotic xanthogranuloma. So what does that look like? It's more, it tends to be more cellular than these other uh, granulomous entities in this category, more tumor-like with the number of histiocytes. Some of them are very bizarre looking large multinucleated cells. You can have areas of hyaline necrosis, some plasma cells, and some cholesterol clefts. And why would you have cholesterol clefts? Well, anytime you have the, word, the phrase xantho in something, that means somewhere you have to see foamy histiocytes and foaminess it's got lipid material that can result in cholesterol clefts. So let's look at a case of necrobotic xanthogranuloma. Immediately you can see you have this dense tumor-like proliferation of these histiocytes. And you go in and you can see that it is technically palisading around these little areas of necrobiosis. Here you have a very bizarre shaped large multinucleated giant cell. I wanna zoom back out and look, show you all of these little pink zones, these are all areas of necrobiosis that this is technically palisading around, even though it looks like a tumor-like proliferation. You have a mixed infiltrate otherwise. Here's some plasma cells and eosinophils, lymphocytes. But the main thing is that you have these dense histiocytes around this area and these bizarre multinucleated cells. If you're lucky, so here's a bunch more of these bizarre multinucleated cells. Here is a foamy histiocyte. So you've got a little bit of lipid material in here making these little white foamy bubbles. And then if you're lucky, you will see these cholesterol clefts. In your infiltrate, you'll see plasma cells because we know necrobiotic xanthogranuloma is associated with plasma cell dyscrasias. Okay. So now we go into the interstitial patterns. So GA can fall into the interstitial pattern, as we mentioned, as can palisaded neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis, which has palisaded in the name, but is very interstitial. So if you've gathered anything from this lecture, is that palisaded and interstitial can be sort of interchangeable in many instances. You can have an interstitial granulomatous drug eruption or granulomatous T-cell lymphoma can have an interstitial pattern. So here, 
As opposed to that round shape we saw with GA, you can see a vaguely palisaded and also an interstitial pattern of histiocytes here, not so linear like we saw with uh, necrobiosis lipoidica. When you go in, you can appreciate that you have these round pink cells that are histiocytes. So this is a granulomatous process. Here's your unhealthy looking collagen, and you have this additional cell type that you didn't see in those other instances, which is a lot of neutrophils. This pattern that vaguely resembles GA with the palisade and granulomatous nature, but kind of goes throughout the whole specimen with a lot of neutrophils is what palisaded neutrophilic and granulomatous dermatitis look like, an entity we see associated with rheumatoid diseases and other collagen vascular diseases, et cetera. Here's a less blurry picture of these histiocytes with the neutrophils, your areas of necrobiosis. See your fuzzy looking collagen is just slightly unhealthy looking necrobiosis. Okay, and then that leads us to separative granulomas. So separative granulomas, really, if you see it, you think of two things. If it is not a ruptured cyst, which is the most common thing I will see with a separative granuloma under the microscope, it will be an infection. So for board's purposes, they'll probably not give you a ruptured cyst, but if you're looking at a separative granuloma, which means a granuloma with numerous neutrophils, you better think infection first until you've ruled it out, either deep fungal or non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. So here in the dermis, we have a dense collection of inflammatory cells going up close. These are histiocytes, so this is granulomatous, filled with neutrophils. When you inspect even closer, you start to see these little round shapes, which are the cell walls of blastomycosis, okay? So separative granulomas, and we're gonna cover these more in detail when we go over all of the infections. I just wanted to, for you to be able to identify the patterns of granulomas from this chapter. And that is it for this section.